was just coming into this basically, you know, in the late 90s myself. So it was like, it was hot off the press, new science, fresh, amazing field of study. So I went and met with the researchers who were doing this basic research of the signaling system and the brain and nervous system. And it yeah, turns is, out. Is that the endocannabinoid system? Yes, yes. It was the endocannabinoid system that I was starting to, to, to discover and read about. And that which was discovered because of people, doctors, researchers trying to find out how marijuana, cannabis worked in the, in the brain and body. And it was widespread ubiquitous system and it was, had huge implications from basically the science of physiology, you know, uh, regulating mood and appetite and memory and inflammation. And I was just kind of like, wow, this is pretty interesting. And um, so anyway, I thought, well, uh, maybe this is, this explains why people might be finding some benefits with using the uh, botanical uh, cannabis for, you know, when, when they when they use it, if 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 it if this if it's targeting the receptors that are in this system and that system is regulating all these important functions, it sort of clicked in my head that there's a rationale to it, and so I started, uh, you know, reading more about that. And I met I met one uh, guy named Fred Gardner who. Uh, was working for the district attorney's office of San Francisco. They came to give a talk on my campus in college on, on, on uh, called Marijuana, What Dare Didn't Teach You, kind of an educational forum, which I really appreciated. And, and he said, you should go, when you go to medical school, you should definitely bring this up into your professors and uh, you know make sure it's in the curriculum somehow. And I took that to heart. And I, I was passionate about natural medicine and uh, complex alternative therapies, and I thought this this, if I'm going to be a medical scientist trying to just discover a new treatment, you know, maybe this is this is this is something I can look into, and that's how I kind of got into it. Well, the endocannabinoid system does, does that actually mean that there are uh, receptors specific? to marijuana? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, they don't just bind to marijuana, uh, compounds in marijuana, but they, uh, in fact, they're very, very old in evolution. They're 600 million years old. Marijuana is about 38 million years old, so they've been around a lot longer, but uh, when marijuana evolved, um, one of the fun things that it did is develop these kind of uh, compounds in its in its um, flowers that really target quite well those that system in a way that doesn't super stimulate it or under stimulate it. Like you know, it's kind of a what's called partial agonism or activity. And when humans came on the scene, you know, 100,000 or so years ago, uh, you know, it, we just uh, there was a kind of a human plant relationship there that was based on this mutual uh, you know co, co evolution and thing where humans found a benefit to the plant and plants found a benefit to humans because it, it got moved all over the world, you know, when it just evolved in one place on earth and then spread. So that cannabis plant was clever or, you know, came up with these compounds that bind to the system, which has important functions in, in, in human physiology. So that's, it's kind of a, uh, you know, not an exclusive match, but a, but a happy match. I almost wonder though, if if you can actually talk to plants, if that conversation has affected the evolution of cannabis, certainly into into Charlotte's Web. <laughs> right, right. So, um, can you explain the difference? Why Charlotte's Web is different? Yeah, well, I mean, cannabis is a uh, <clears throat> what we normally think of in North America, in the United States, is uh, you know, the marijuana gives you psychoactive effect. It alters your consciousness, your perception, your awareness of time, or, or euphoria, and um, what we call psychological activity or psychoactivity for short. Um, and you know, there are, but there are other types of marijuana. It's a very diverse, genetically diverse plant. There are other types where the compounds that we think are most responsible for that are kind of subdued and very low in quantity. And other compounds that also have psychological benefits, but not in this sort of acute, active form, but more in a longer term. Uh, in the background, kind of boosting of uh, like like a, maybe the way an antidepressant might work. You know, it doesn't you don't all of a sudden feel it. You feel it over time. Uh, there are other compounds that cannabis makes that are like that that still have benefits psychologically and neurologically in other in other fields, but uh, you know uh, it, they don't have that immediate effect. So that that's or they don't have that immediate psychologically active effect that THC does. So there's, these strains are called CBD rich strains. CBD short for cannabidiol. And um, you know some some 
growers in Colorado, I think, bred some genetics from some strains that had been found in California that were rich in this. So this, is, this has been around since the beginning of cannabis, too. It's just humans have just chosen to select different strains over time, depending on what their, what their needs were. And probably a lot of the feral hemp in this country, that's the wild growing cannabis that was used in agriculture for so much part of the founding of this country and beyond, that the Spaniards brought over, that the English brought over, that the French brought over, you know, to try to grow for their sh ships and rigging and, ra and sails, and that the uh, Americans also grew for, for, for rope and other purposes. That stuff may escape those farms and is now sort of semi-domesticated wild, and that those plants probably have some CBD in them too, you know, maybe a few percentage points. So all of this cannabis, CBD cannabis is around in our environment. We didn't really take full advantage of that genetics um, as well as we could have until more recently where people are now starting to understand that these have really important properties, especially in the case of convulsive disorders, seizure disorders. And that's um, when, when a, a woman, um, sought it for her daughter, um, a woman named Paige Fiji, um, whose daughter had a severe genetic disorder causing severe seizure syndrome, uh, and, and was really, um, they had decided that the, the next time that she was going to seize, if, she, if, uh, if she, they had to resuscitate, you know, they said they were saying, we don't really want to resuscitate, there's just more harm than good, that's what they thought, that's how far gone this young girl was. But uh, when she watched a video of a, of a child in Colorado, uh, sorry, California, named uh, Jaden, I believe, who had used this uh, uh, through his dad's help from a dispensary in Oakland. Um, she thought, well, maybe this, who also had Dravet syndrome, she thought maybe I could, that's the syndrome her daughter has, and maybe it could work for her too. And it turned out it did. And uh, they, then she got that back to the, to the growing group in Colorado, in Colorado Springs, and they said, well, we'll just name it after your daughter. <laughs> that's how it became Charlotte's Web, because uh, her daughter was named Charlotte Fiji. So it's, a, it's quite a, it's a kind of a, a branding and labeling that's about children, that's about, you know, Charlotte's Web, of course, is a famous book by E.B. White, which is a book we read as kids, and it, it kind of, and also, I think it harkens that sort of innocence of youth and the kids should be able to play and do story time and, you know, not be saddled with severe, you know, in and out of the hospital and ICU uh, kind of uh, situations. So that's what I think of when I think of CBD and Charlotte's Web. It, it, it tells you a whole kind of hidden other side to cannabis that all the propaganda and the reefer madness kind of pushed under the rug. You don't have to take it in a smoked form. That the plant makes abundant quantities of it, um, and as far as we know, it doesn't have a lethal dose. So it should be better studied, certainly. But we know that we can find safe margins for people who've been using it for a long time. So you can extract that out into an, you know, from take the, the the sap of cannabis, just like the maple tree makes sap. You don't have to eat the whole tree. You just take the sap part of it, and and you know, uh, or if you don't have to smoke the whole tree, you take you just can. can um, dose the sap, and that's what they've been doing. They've been cleanly extracting, growing, and measuring the quantity of CBD and other compounds in, in, the, in the sap, in the oil, and then giving that to the kids uh, twice a day in certain you know, dose formats. And it seems to be, you know, a lot of epileptologists are very excited about it. It's been presented at the American Epileptological Association meetings. It's been published in several of the leading epilepsy journals more recently, so it's, it's not, um, it's, it's serious stuff, and the Epilepsy Foundation says that we have to, you know, change the laws to accommodate for this experimental empiric treatment uses, so it's, it's not, it, you know, these legislators don't know, they haven't, aren't up on the uh, opinions of the, of the medical community.